um, there's are uh, essentially three different types of land. One are um, uh, tribal trust land. So this is the the land that's held by the tribe itself. Um, that's usually where the tribal headquarters is. There might you know schools, um, medical facilities. If there's um, a business, um, oftentimes that's going to be located on tribal trust land. Um, you know, and it could be anything from a manufacturing facility to a convenience store. Um, but if it's owned and operated by the tribe, it's usually on tribal trust land. Um, and then, uh, it, it, and sometimes hunting and fishing grounds are also uh, tribal trust land as well. So those are lands owned by the tribe, and they're held in trust by the United States for the benefit of the tribe. And then the other type, or the second type of land, are allotments. So we talked about the allotment period and how uh, reservations were divided up into uh, individual parcels of land. And uh, that the federal government uh, took those lands into trust um, and held them in trust for the benefit of individual Indians. And so those are those allotments, those individually owned Indian lands. There's also um, uh, sometimes uh, res what are called restricted fee lands. Um, those are mostly in Oklahoma. Those are also uh, Indian country, but we're just going to uh, talk about allotments and, um, and, and those restricted fee lands sort of as the same thing. Um, and then the third type of land that uh, you typically find within an Indian reservation are the non-Indian fee lands. So again, going back to the, to the allotment period when, uh, when people got those individual allotments and there were uh, leftover parcels of lands that went to non-Indians, those were fee patented uh, to those people, and we refer to those as non-Indian fee lands. Um, so those are the th three types of uh, lands that exist uh, within the reservation, and um, so the um, and where uh, a dispute or a crime arises, uh, whether it's uh, uh, one of those uh, types of lands, becomes uh, very very important. So. First, let's talk about uh, criminal jurisdiction in Indian country. Uh, generally, when a crime is committed in Indian country, it can uh, come under either federal jurisdiction, tribal jurisdiction, or state jurisdiction. And at times, um, federal jurisdiction and tribal jurisdiction will be concurrent. And I'm putting up this slide, um, and as I, as I talk about this, and, and talk about the identity of the parties and, and where it occurs, it might be helpful to kind of find it on this table, and uh, that will sort of help uh, uh, guide the, the discussion a little bit. <clears throat> so we're, uh, we're focusing on lands with, within, the, within the reservation, um, uh, the, uh, the tribal trust lands and um, allotments. Um, so <clears throat> which government um, has uh, jurisdiction on those Indian lands within Indian country uh, depends on the identity, the political identity of the perpetrator and the victim. So tribes have jurisdiction over Indians on Indian lands. So if, uh, if an Indian commits a crime uh, on tribal trust land or on one of those allotments, the, uh, the tribe is going to have a jurisdiction. And this includes uh, both member and non-member Indians. So don't even have to be a member of the tribe. The tribe gets uh, jurisdiction. Um, and so there's, there's two caveats to this, this, or maybe considerations to tribal jurisdiction um, on tribal lands, on Indian lands. Um, the first consideration is um, that the U.S. Constitution uh, doesn't apply to Indian tribes. Remember, we talked about tribes as being pre-constitutional governments, um, as extra-constitutional governments. So um, uh, because 
they were not a party to the United States Constitution, it doesn't apply to an Indian tribe. And so that means that um, during criminal proceedings, um, uh, the Bill of Rights uh, doesn't apply uh, uh, during that tribal uh, criminal proceeding. And so to, um, if you will, fill this, this void uh, of the Constitution not applying in Indian country, in 1968, Congress passed the Indian Civil Rights Act, and that statutorily applied most of the provisions of the Bill of Rights um, to uh, tribal court proceedings and, and criminal matters. Um, it didn't uh, extend all of, of, of those provisions. Most notably, there's, there's no right to counsel um, in uh, tribal court. And the other thing that the Indian Civil Rights Act did was it limited tribal court sentencing authority. So uh, now uh, tribal courts in criminal matters uh, only have the authority uh, to sentence to uh, one year uh, and a $5,000 fine. So um, that's while tribes have uh, jurisdiction over all Indians on, on Indian lands, um, their uh, sentencing authority is, is somewhat limited. Now there's uh, an exception to this, um, and that's where uh, under the Violence Against Women Act uh, for uh, domestic violence offenses, uh, tribes can increase uh, that sentencing authority in some circumstances. So, um, so tr uh, the Indian, Indian tribes have uh, criminal jurisdiction over Indians on Indian land. Um, so now let's look at uh, the concurrent jurisdiction of the federal government. <clears throat> and um, the federal government, uh, if you go back to, uh, to colonial days, Indian country was the sole province of tribes. And shortly after the revolution, uh, the federal government passed a statute that extended criminal juris the federal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians committing crimes against Indians in Indian country. So non-Indians in Indian country committing crimes against Indians, there would be federal jurisdiction. In 1817, federal criminal jurisdiction was statutorily uh, extended to include crimes by both Indians and non-Indians against non-Indian people. And the next thing that, that developed in this area of federal jurisdiction was the Crow Dog case, which was in, um, uh, came in 1883. And the basic facts of the case were that uh, Crow Dog murdered Spotted Isle, Owl on the uh, uh, Rosebud Sioux Reservation and was convicted in tribal court of the murder and was given a, a, a traditional uh, tribal punishment um, uh, that included reparations and, and other things to the to the family of the deceased, um, but was not given the death penalty. To, uh, typically, uh, uh, the death penalty isn't a, a traditional uh, tribal court sentence for committing a crime, um, and so federal authorities were unhappy with this and brought uh, Crow Dog into federal court, into the uh, Dakota Territorial Court, convicted him of murder there, and uh, he was sentenced to death. And this case reached the Supreme Court, which held that uh, the General Crimes Act uh, did not include crimes by Indians against Indians in Indian country. So after the Crow Dog case, uh, Congress passed the Major Crimes Act. And this extended federal jurisdiction uh, into Indian country over seven uh, what are referred to as major crimes, murder, manslaughter, rape, assault with uh, intent to kill, arson, burglary, and larceny. And it's been subsequently um, extended to include additional crimes. But these are Indian on Indian crimes in Indian country. And um, so the Major Crimes Act uh, uh, extended federal authority over these crimes. So now that means that there's uh, concurrent jurisdiction over these tribes. So the tribe has jurisdiction and the federal government has jurisdiction. 
Uh, another important case that came about in 1886, uh, the Kagama case, and the, uh, the court held there that this uh, federal intrusion into internal tribal affairs was justified by the dependent status of tribes and their status as, quote, wards of the federal government. So, you know, just take a moment to think about where we are in the timeline. Uh, that's an 1886 case, so you're uh, well into this allotment period and, and what's the, the policy of the United States at that time and how are Indians thought about. And that's uh, reflected in this case, talking about Indians as wards of the United States. Uh, today, tribes retain jurisdiction um, over crimes by Indians, against Indians, uh, that, and those listed in the Major Crimes Act, they're shared jurisdiction with the federal government. So that's the um, Indian on Indian on Indian crime in Indian country. So what about the non-Indian perpetrator? So uh, a non-Indian on Indian lands uh, commits a crime. Uh, where is the authority there? Um, although many of the uh, early treaties with tribes embodied and affirmed tribal uh, criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians, uh, this declined during the removal and allotment periods. And the uh, federal government assumed primarily authority uh, with the Major Crimes Act. But uh, federal enforcement um, of these crimes by non-Indians was uh, very lax. And uh, after uh, the Indian Reorganization Act was passed, uh, tribal laws uh, for crimes generally uh, by their own force only applied uh, to Indians. And so there was really this uh, uh, void for uh, criminal enforcement in Indian country for non-Indians committing crimes. And by the 1970s, a lot of tribes began prosecuting uh, non-Indians for crimes committed in Indian country, uh, contending that this was part of their inherent sovereign authority. And one of those cases made it to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1978, Oliphant v. Uh, Suquamish. And there the court held that tribes lack criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. So uh, after Oliphant, uh, the, the rule is clear. If a crime is, uh, is committed by a non-Indian against an Indian, then the federal government has uh, jurisdiction over that. And if the victim is a non-Indian, then the state has jurisdiction. So if you have a non-Indian perpetrator, an Indian victim, it's going to be federal jurisdiction. If it's a non-Indian perpetrator and a non-Indian victim, state jurisdiction. So um, let's talk a little bit more about state jurisdiction. Um, outside Indian country, uh, states have general criminal jurisdiction, and this applies to uh, Indians. So Indians outside Indian country, the state can exercise its uh, general criminal jurisdiction. But on Indian lands, uh, when we're in Indian country, uh, states have no jurisdiction over crimes committed by Indians. Uh, those crimes uh, fall under federal and tribal jurisdiction. For crimes on Indian lands, state jurisdiction then is limited to crimes that do not concern Indians or Indian interests. That means that states are only going to have uh, jurisdiction over non-Indian against non-Indian crimes. Um, and this rule um, holds true for victimless crimes as well. Uh, so, for example, drug, offense, drug offenses. So if um, a non-Indian um, has a drug offense uh, on Indian lands, uh, then that's going to go to state court. Um, but um, crimes against Indian property interests are not victimless crimes. Um, so there, uh, the feds are going to have jurisdictions, jurisdiction. So, um, if looking at uh, looking at this chart here and sort of summarizing um, all of that information, you can kind of boil it down a little bit. So, if you have um, uh, for crimes on Indian lands, if you have an Indian perpetrator, then you're going to have tribal jurisdiction, 
um, and federal concurrent jurisdiction for major crimes. If you have a non-Indian perpetrator, uh, then you have to look at the victim and the type of the crime. Uh, if it's an Indian victim, exclusive federal jurisdiction. If it's a non-Indian victim, exclusive state jurisdiction, and then the victimless crime uh, is exclusive state jurisdiction. And then keep in mind that um, anywhere here that you see that, that tribal uh, jurisdictional authority, there's going to be the uh, limitation uh, placed on uh, tribal sentences uh, that can be imposed. So um, one of the uh, issues uh, that comes up uh, due to all of this uh, complexity for criminal jurisdiction um, is, so what about the power to arrest? You have, you have all of these different types of Indian lands within, uh, within a reservation. Um, you have Indians and non-Indians there. Um, you have state law enforcement authorities, tribal, uh, you have the county sheriff, maybe local police. So um, how are they going to know uh, when they're encountering a person what their, what their political identity is, right? Because that's going to dictate um, who has jurisdiction because um, the power to arrest is going to follow criminal jurisdiction, right? So the classic sort of hypothetical is like a, um, is a traffic stop, a highway stop. Uh, when the officer makes that stop, not going to have any idea what the political identity of that person is, right? They've just uh, suspected that they witnessed a crime. Um, so what courts have generally held in this situation is that um, that the police officer uh, can briefly detain the person to um, ascertain what their political identity is, and then if that officer is, doesn't have jurisdiction, then they can uh, turn that person over to the property author proper authorities, and um, so all and and all of this this complexity has also given rise to some other solutions as well. So um, one fairly common one is cross deputization agreements. So, um, for example, I come from the uh, Cherokee Nation, and our tribe uh, has cross deputization agreements with. Uh, local sheriffs and local police authorities um, um, so that uh, they can all um, make arrests within uh, one, one another's uh, uh, territory. And that um, solves a lot of these uh, problems when that can be achieved. So one more thing um, that's very, very important when it comes to uh, criminal jurisdiction. And uh, earlier when we were talking about the termination era, I mentioned that part of uh, carrying out this this uh, policy uh, was the extension of state jurisdiction into Indian country. And uh, to do that, Congress uh, passed this law, Public Law 280. And what it, what it did was it delegated federal criminal authority uh, jurisdiction uh, to some states. So if you look back at the at the grid that's on on the slide, anywhere here uh, that you see that there's that there's federal authority, if it's a public law 280 state, then uh, uh, that state then the state's going to have uh, delegated authority from the tribal government or from the federal government. Uh, so the the there were two uh, types of states under public law 280. There were these mandatory states and these optional states. So the mandatory ones uh, were California, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Oregon, and Alaska. Uh, so there it was mandatory that the federal government delegated this, this criminal jurisdiction and, and some civil jurisdiction as well um, uh, down to the state. And then uh, if it was, there was also this option that other states could also uh, take on this, this authority if they chose to, and that required consent from the tribes. But for the mandatory states, no consent necessary. Um, so in those uh, optional states, uh, major crimes uh, jurisdiction came concurrent with the federal government. And 
Um, there was also a mechanism there called retrocession. And a number of states took advantage of this where uh, later on they said, well, we took on this, this criminal jurisdiction, but now we've decided that it really wasn't such a great idea and we don't want it, and um, uh, retroceded uh, to the federal government that jurisdiction. And that happened a lot, especially during the 1970s and 80s. And also under the Tribal Law and Order Act, um, tribes can request that the federal government resume uh, criminal jurisdiction uh, in those public law 280 states. Um, and the result is that there uh, uh, will be concurrent state and federal jurisdiction uh, for those areas. areas. So uh, that's our, our basic overview of uh, criminal jurisdiction and the power of tribes uh, to, to punish particularly um, uh, their own members. And, and uh, if the tribe can't do it, then who has jurisdiction in Indian country over particular crimes? And um, I would encourage you, uh, this, the, this uh, PowerPoint will be available uh, to you for download, and, and uh, if this is an area you're interested in, you want to probably keep this, um, this grid here because it will help you to figure out uh, these jurisdictional problems. And uh, you'll see it's noted on here that um, I just adapted this from, uh, from Canby's American Indian Law in a Nutshell book, um, which I would highly recommend uh, if you're interested in this area. So the, um, the next area that I'd like to talk about is adjudicatory jurisdiction in civil matters for civil disputes. And um, this is a very uh, uncertain era, area in many ways. There's, there are some, some pretty defined rules, but there's a lot of gray area when it comes to tribal civil jurisdiction. And I'm going to uh, try to point out some of those gray areas for you. I won't go into a lot of the uh, the arguments on both sides and, and what the particular rule should be, but um, I'll try to point those out to you as we go along. So um, since the allotment era, I mentioned before when we talked about Wooster versus Georgia that uh, the court had modified that bright line rule. So uh, Wooster versus Georgia had this very bright line rule um, that really focused just on physical presence in Indian country. And especially since uh, since the allotment era, the court has made some, some modifications um, to that rule. And in, in certain respects, um, Tribal civil jurisdiction is uh, based on this uh, the right to exclude, right, that we, we talked about earlier, that as part of a tribe's uh, inherent uh, uh, sovereign authority as the power to exclude others. But um, what one theme that you'll see emerging in a lot of these civil jurisdiction cases is this idea that during the allotment era when non-Indians acquired uh, fee lands with, uh, within Indian country, um, that that diminished a tribe's right to exclude, right? These non-Indians now have these, these fee patented lands and the, uh, the tribe cannot, um, exclude them from, uh, from their own fee lands. Uh, so, um, that is a theme that comes up in, um, uh, in the court's modification of the of the bright line rule, is that somehow the the allotment era and, and non-Indians coming into Indian country modified this right to exclude and somewhat diminished uh, civil jurisdiction. <clears throat> so, as I said before, um, jurisdiction for tribes hinges on these on these two sort of initial questions. Um, the who and the where. So um, civil jurisdiction hinges uh, largely on the, the location of the activity that gives rise to a dispute. Um, and unlike criminal jurisdiction, there's probably uh, 
a distinction between members and non-members in the civil context. So I had said in, in criminal jurisdiction that um, tribes uh, could assert jurisdiction over Indians, no matter what tribe they were from. There's probably a, a distinction in the civil context of members versus non-members. I'm going to kind of I'm going to talk about Indians and non-Indians to sort of simplify the conversation a little bit, but just keep that in mind that there there may actually be that that distinction. <clears throat> and compared to criminal jurisdiction, the federal government has a much smaller role in the civil context. So remember, the increased federal role came from the largely from the Major Crimes Act, and there's no equivalent in the civil context. Um, so the uh, federal government has this much smaller role. Um, there can be uh, federal court jurisdiction um, when there's a, uh, a, dis a cause of action arises under uh, common law or a federal statute, but by and large the, the federal role is pretty small initially. Now, where uh, federal courts can come into uh, a more sort of prominent role in this context um, is when the uh, non-Indian party wants to challenge a tribe's jurisdiction. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, uh, later on, but that's really the federal role is, um, uh, is when a party wants to challenge tribal jurisdiction. So I think in the in in the analysis of uh, of looking at criminal or civil jurisdiction, it's helpful to first focus on where the dispute arises. So is it is it Indian land or is it non-Indian land within the reservation, and then look to the the political identity of the defendant. The, the analysis focuses a bit more on the identity of, of the defendant in the civil context. So let's look first at tribal jurisdiction. Um, so we're, we're talking about uh, within Indian country, within the bounds of an Indian reservation, and specifically on tribal lands. So those um, are Indian lands, so that the, the tribal communal lands um, as well as the individual allotments, Indian lands. So an Indian versus Indian dispute that arises on Indian land can go to tribal court. And um, um, even for disputes but, uh, for a non-Indian against an Indian, that will go to tribal court too when it's on, on Indian land. And that's Williams versus Lee from 1959. So when the dispute arises on Indian land and you've got an Indian defendant, it's going to go to tribal 